Revelation. New chapter. Write that down in your calendar. That we graduated today. To a different chapter. Revelation chapter 10. Uh, <clears throat> years ago. Quit it, quit it, quit it, quit it. Years ago, when... I was spending a lot of time studying the Bible. I couldn't get enough of it. Uh, my head was soft and bouncy like a sponge. And it still is just soft and bouncy. But I was studying the trumpets in all through the Bible, not just the seven trumpets, but trumpets in general, and studying the word mystery, uh, and studying clouds in the Bible. And all of them merged and led me to Revelation chapter 10. And I began to look at this, and I, I took... Um, a course on Revelation while I was in Bible college and um, I nearly flunked it. I nearly flunked it. Um, but I don't recall the professor who was amillennial and he just passed away a couple years ago, Thomas Marbury. Uh, he was a very smart man, very intelligent man. Uh, had a doctorate from Baylor University, uh, and it was it he was it was at Baylor University that he was taught on millennialism. On millennialism is the idea that the thousand years is symbolic; it's a figurative time, and it doesn't mean exactly one thousand years. They they reel out this notion that to the to the Greeks who lived 2,000 years ago, who didn't often hear of the number 1,000, so they didn't really comprehend it, to them, the number 1,000 was figurative of a large amount of things. In other words, if somebody was telling you a story and they used 1,000 of something in that story, then to that person who's hearing the story, it's supposed to mean a large amount of whatever it is. If it's a thousand years, then it's an undetermined large amount of years. Does everybody follow me on that? They say it's just simply symbolic, it's metaphor, it's allegory, but it doesn't literally mean a thousand years. That's what they came up with. And um, so then all the other symbols in the book of Revelation, like a beast with seven heads, they said that it was John's way of writing about whoever was Caesar at that time, whoever was the head of the Roman government and the Roman Empire, and that he didn't really have seven heads, but the seven heads were symbolic of seven, I don't know what they think it is. And the ten horns are representative of ten this or ten that. But it doesn't really mean that the beast had ten horns. It doesn't really mean that he had seven heads. And it doesn't really mean that Caesar is a beast. And yet, you don't have the Bible telling you any different. When John sees this thing coming up out of the sea, he's able to determine right then and there that it's not a human. It's not an ordinary man. It is a beast in every way. So... <clears throat> I listened to that for a whole semester, and um, believe it or not, back in 1997 uh, when God called me to study prophecy, uh, and I decided to throw everything out, I even told God, God, if you want me to be amillennial, I'll be amillennial. Well, I'm glad he didn't want me there, so, because now I don't limit God to a predefined interpretation. God can say what God wants to say, how he wants to say it. And um, I have a friend <clears throat> who um, went to college with me, and his dad was amillennial. He grew up amillennial. And, of course, the, the course that he took in the universities that he went to, he's got a doctorate in theology. 
um, he believed in amillennialism because that's what he was taught, that's what he was told as a child, so that's what he believed. But recently, I had a chance to talk to him, and he said, he actually called me and wanted to know something. And so I told him what I thought, I don't remember what it was, <clears throat> but he said, you know, he said, I grew up, he said, if I was to be characterized as anything, it would be amillennial. I said, yeah, I knew that. And he said, here lately, I've been rereading the Bible. And he said, that doesn't, that doesn't work in my mind anymore. It doesn't match what I read in the scriptures. And I'm just going, yes, God, keep going, keep going, keep doing it. And he said, um, oh, what was it? He had a professor tell him, oh, this, he had a professor that was a dyed-in-the-wool five-point tulip Calvinist. And I mean, wouldn't be shaken from anybody. Over the years, he had one student after another try to argue with him. And he always won all the arguments. And he never changed. But he ended up being real sick toward the end of his life. And while he's sick, God deals with him. And he's reading his Bible every day. I mean, he's just studying the Bible. And I'm trying to remember exactly how he said it because it was really, really neat. And I think the way it goes is something like, for years, he followed how a man told him to interpret what God said. But now he's at a point in his life where God is doing the interpreting and not man. Something like that. I don't remember the exact quote. The exact quote is a lot better than what I just gave it to you. But the bottom line is, he's believing a literal interpretation of the Bible. He's believing exactly what it says. And so, <clears throat> when I got to study Revelation chapter 10, it really, really altered my perception of how I used to believe that things were going to be laid out. And I'll get into that as time goes on. Can somebody get me a bottle of water? Thank you very much, Dave. I, uh, <clears throat> I had a little episode this morning when I got here. And, uh, well, I don't want one that's already half drunk by David. It's okay. Okay. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I grabbed what I thought was a protein bar this morning. And it wasn't. It's something Lisa bought for Caleb. And it has a little protein in it, but it's got a lot of sugar in it. A lot. And um, when my blood sugar gets high, it feels like I have the flu. You know how you just have no energy at all? And I'm sitting there at my desk this morning. We got here. We always get here early. And I mean, my blood sugar, I could feel it going up. I'm going, oh, no. And uh, the longer I sat there, the worse I felt. And I finally went and laid down. And I'm like... I can't get up. I can't get off the couch. And so I was prepared to have somebody take Sunday school and somebody take the church service. But it's working. It's better now, but it's left me with a dry mouth. So just, I beg your pardon. Revelation chapter 10. Let's start reading it. Let's read. Um, let's read down through verse 3. All right, because we're not going to get any farther than that. In fact, we're not going to get any farther than half of the first verse. Um, and I saw another mighty angel. Uh, now, if you're inclined to underline things, underline angel. Underline come down. Underline cloud. Underline rainbow. Underline sun. Underline feet as pillars of fire. Those things there are important. Very important. Now, anybody has a right, of, obviously, to disagree with my interpretation of this. Um, so I would just simply ask that you study the scriptures and find out uh, from heaven, from the Holy Spirit, uh, what this means. But let's examine it. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. He's clothed with a cloud. A rainbow was upon his head. And think about what all these symbols mean. And his face was, as it were, the sun. 
Think about what that means. And his feet as pillars of fire. Think about pillars of fire and where you saw them last in the Bible. In verse 2, he had in his hand a little book open. Ask yourself the question, where did he get the book? And who opened it? Okay? And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. Ask yourself the question, what is it that the feet, when they're standing on something, what is it that they represent? What meaning does it have? Dominion, right? You got, a, you got our cheaters up here. They've listened to everything I've had to say for the last six years. So I moved them to the head of the class, just to let everybody know. Um, verse 3, and he cried with a loud voice as when a lion. Think of, think of the possibilities here of what a lion could represent. And when he had cried, seven thunders. Think of the number seven. And think of what thunders are and what they represent. Seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders, I said I was going to stop at verse 3, but I'm going to continue. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. Now when I was studying this out, I was mad and aggravated with God. Because here is a mystery that apparently has no solution to. There's no answer. There's no revelation of what's sealed in these seven thunders. Okay? Um, we, we have no idea what's going on here um, and what these things uttered. And then it dawned on me, because I believe that God has already given to mankind everything that he needs to both interpret this book and to understand it and especially for those to whom it was written who are going to go through this time here and what this represents so if I believe that God has provided the answer already to mankind then I believe it's in the Bible somewhere and you might say now wait a minute God said it couldn't be written no that's not what he said what God told John was that John was not supposed to write what the seven thunders uttered. But that doesn't include all of the other biblical authors from writing it down. Because, uh, Brother George, if I came in a week from now, next Sunday, and I said, you know, I had dreams every night this week for seven nights and during these seven nights God showed me what each of these seven thunders represented and I'm gonna share it with you but God told it to me and I don't know of anybody else that God has told is that okay with you why not no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation none God's not going to give it to one person so that that because you know what a, what that man will do he'll try to make money off of it or he'll try to gain power or he'll try to gain attention from other people he wants people to come to him and get the answers and if you don't get it from me you're not going to get the true answers you must get it from me that's the Nicolaitan doctrine that Jesus said he hated okay so if God's going to share it with one he's going to share it with all Okay, so that's what I believe. And I believe that then it would be written, Surely the Lord doeth nothing, but he revealeth his secret to his servants, the prophets. And that phrase, his servant, the prophets, is actually in this chapter. Um, <clears throat> it says in verse 5, And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and, all, and, and the things that are, therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. 
But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, which is the one with the trumpet, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished. And here it is. As he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. That's an interesting phrase in the Bible. You should study it out sometime. Now, let's start breaking this down. The first thing is we have to, we have to, this is a hurdle to some people. Or a brick wall that they think that they cannot pass through. Is that this cannot be, in, in Revelation 10, I believe that this is speaking of Christ. Now, again, you're free to believe something different. All right? Uh, but I think that everything here in this text points us in the direction of one and one only, and that is Jesus Christ. And I'll explain that as I go on. So the first question that we have to have answered is, is Jesus ever characterized or referred to in the Bible as an angel? The answer is yes. Multiple, multiple times. Genesis 48. Turn there. Genesis 48, verse 15. This would be when Joseph brought Manasseh and Ephraim, his two sons, to Jacob to be blessed by, them, by him. And remember that Jacob crossed his arms and gave, gave the wrong blessing in Joseph's mind. No, Dad, no, Dad. You're giving the right-hand blessing to the second-born son. And you're giving the left-hand blessing to the first-born son. God, uh, uh, Jacob's not supposed to be that way, Dad. It's not, you're doing it wrong. Jacob said, son, I know what I'm doing. I may be blind, but I ain't stupid. And he did exactly what the Holy Ghost commanded him to do. He gave the first-born son blessing to the second-born son, Manasseh. And he gave the first or the second-born son the blessing of the first-born son. And I, won't, I don't have time to get into all that, but that's, that's the context of what we're dealing with here. And so we pick it up in verse 15. And, and he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life, all my life long unto this day. Verse 16, the angel and the translators wanted us to know that they believed that this was speaking of Christ. The angel which redeemed me from all evil. And uh, what is it that we're talking about? Did Jacob have an interaction with an angel during his life? And what was, it, what was it about? What happened in that story? He wrestled with a man, the Bible says. And he's wrestling and wrestling and wrestling. Where is that? What chapter is that? Uh, I should have put this in my notes and I didn't do it. I didn't do it. That would be Genesis, I think it's 33, I think. No, 32. Look in verse 25. When he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his side. This is the man. This is the angel. The angel touched the hollow of of Jacob's thigh. In other words, we think he put it out of joint. Yeah, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. You understand what that hollow is? That's that ball joint that he's got in his hip. Okay? And he pulled his hip bone, his femur, out of socket there. And he said, let me go. <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> no, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. This is what Jacob's saying. And I can tell you from a practical stance, there's nothing in the world like wrestling with God himself and not giving up until God blesses you. I believe that every true believer 
will run into that at least once in their life. Where God is going to lay it on their heart to wrestle with God in prayer and to not give up praying until God has either given you the answer you sought after or given you a better answer that you could have never thought of. But the possibility or the idea of accepting no answer from God just is out of the question. In other words, you have no choice but to call upon God and do it prevailing with God until God answers your prayer. That's how these people ended up here. 2000, it start, your trip started in 2008. You didn't know it. I didn't know it. But in 2008, I spent three days in that room, not eating from sunup to sundown. And I, re I told God, God, I'm going to wrestle with you until you bless me. You're going to have to do something with me or I'm going to get out. I'm going to walk away. I'm going to leave it all. And sure enough, sure enough, God blessed. Amen. God, did God bless? He did. And I guarantee you, I'm not somebody special. And I, I'll tell you this. I knew better than to make a bunch of promises with God that I, didn't, I knew I couldn't keep. Don't do that. Don't do that. I mean, you might think it'll impress God, but God's not fooled. And God already knows whether you're going to keep that promise or not. So unless you absolutely 100% know that God's leading you in that direction, I wouldn't tell God, God, I'll, God, I'll, 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 I'll get me out of this foxhole and I'll believe it. I'll be a servant for you. I'll go be a Catholic priest. That's what some people do. Okay. And then when they get out of the foxhole, they're going, no, I want me a wife worse than I want to be a Catholic priest. So anyway, he's wrestling with God and he who the Bible calls the man here, uh, in verse 24, there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And so, uh, back in Genesis 48, he says, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. And by the way, did Jacob get his name changed? Israel. Because what does Israel mean? It says right here, uh, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. No, he named it Peniel. That's why he named it Peniel. Uh, let's see here. Where's the Israel come in? Ah, verse 28. Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men and hast prevailed. And so Jacob is reminding Joseph of this story. The angel which redeemed me from all evil... Bless the lads. Now, does an ordinary angel have the ability to redeem people? No. Only God can do that. So the translators looking at this, even though when they're looking at Hebrew and Greek manuscripts, in some cases, like, well, this is in Hebrew. In Hebrew, there are no big case and lowercase letters. There's just letters. So they, they don't capitalize the first letter of a name or of a word that uh, is in, points in the direction of deity. They don't do that. So the translators looking at this don't see a capital Aleph at the beginning of this word. They simply see whatever the word is here in Hebrew, written out in just plain letters. But because this angel has the power of redemption, then this angel then must be God because normal angels don't have that ability. The angel which redeemed me from all evil bless the lads and let my name be named on them and the name of my father is Abraham Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And boy, are they a multitude. Amen. Uh, turn to Exodus 3. Oh, man. Exodus 3. <laughs> if you... If you're looking in the Old Testament for proof of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, you'll see it right here in Exodus 3. 
And I have it outlined or underlined. Exodus 3, 2, and the angel of the Lord. Now notice the A in angel is not capitalized. It's not. So you can't use the argument in Revelation 10 that this angel is not Jesus or else they would have capitalized it. Because clearly this angel is God in visible form showing himself to Moses. But the translators didn't capitalize the letter A in angel. So that in itself doesn't prove anything or disprove anything. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. So we know this is an extraordinary fire or a supernatural fire. It's not ordinary fire of this earth because the bush was not consumed in the fire. Verse 3, and Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when, here's the second name, the Lord saw that he turned not aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. Now, go back to verse 2. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire. And where is the flame of fire? Where is it? Exactly. Where is it? In the midst of the bush. Now look down at verse 4. God called unto him from where? Same place. So do you get that? The angel of the Lord is God. And he's in the midst of the bush. When the Lord saw that, that's another name for God. It's Jehovah. Um, other names and other words for him are Elohim. Um, El. But it's God. So you have the angel of the Lord. That's God. The Lord. That's God. And then God. That's God. Called unto him out of the midst of the bush. The same thing is, is like seeing, it's like a, it's like a, um, it's like a play on words teaching us the Godhead in Old Testament form. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, you see God saying, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Three. So you have all three in Genesis 1 being part of creating man out of the dust of the earth. You have God breathing into his nostrils the breath of life. The breath of life comes from the Holy Spirit. So you have also in Genesis 1 that teaching us, or teach, actually it's meant for the Jews, teaching the Jews that God is three. That's why he's named Elohim. Because anytime you add an I am to a word in Hebrew, what does it do? Makes it plural. Okay? So if you have the Anakims, they're the sons of Anak, but you add the I am and it makes it plural. The Anakim is not just one person, it's a group of people. El, who is God's name, changed into Elohim, which means God in the plural sense. Not that we believe in different gods or multiple gods, because the Bible clearly tells us that there is not multiple gods that we worship. There is only how many gods? One. And yet that one God is three. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Now, I don't understand it, but I believe it. Amen? Just believe it. And don't let anybody use trickery to deceive you because I'm telling you the Jehovah's Witness are good at this they've actually the Jehovah's Witness people who come up to your door have actually been trained to get you to stop thinking of God as a Trinity and thinking of God the Father alone as the only God while Jesus is not God they're trained in doing that on your front doorstep 
You haven't been trained to teach them the true doctrine. So who has the advantage here? They do. My advice to you is to let God train you so that no man can take away what it is that you say you believe. Because I'm telling you, one of my, one of my uh, jobs when I was in Bible college out in Oklahoma was there was this t-shirt shop in a little kiosk in a mall. And I was making t-shirts. And I did such a tremendous job at it that the boss let me go early. <clears throat> Mike, you've made enough. Thank you. The lady that ran that kiosk, um, she was a nice lady. She's an older woman. But I tried to witness to her one day because I knew that she was Jehovah's Witness. And she looked at me and she said, Mike, do me a favor. Do us both a favor. She said, do your work. Focus on your work. And don't try to convert me. She knew what I was doing. She said, I taught Sunday school in a Southern Baptist church for 20 years. 20 years. She taught Sunday school. And the first time the Jehovah's Witness came to her door, she followed him. And was a dyed in the wool, die hard Jehovah's Witness. See, I'm telling you, these people are trained in what they're doing. Your obligation is to train yourself in the other direction. Exercise thyself rather in the godliness, Paul says. That means train yourself to know how you can defend these faith, this faith and these beliefs that we have. Okay? So anyway, I'll let go of that. But obviously the angel here in Exodus 3 is God. He's the angel of the Lord. He is the Lord and he is God. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. We thank you for it, God. Open our eyes to great and marvelous things. We pray, Lord, that you bless this morning's service. And Father, for all of those, Lord, that we encountered last weekend that didn't know that a preacher was going to show up and challenge their belief system. And yet, Father, they're challenged. And Lord, we, you know we've already had one to call in here because he had questions and he wants to know the truth. And I pray, dear God, that you would bless that man with the truth. And Father, we pray, dear God, that you would bless us all with the truth and help us to not be pulled and led astray. Bless your word. Make it mighty in our life, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.